So tonight we heard the story of Susanna, which is taken from the uh, prophet Daniel. Uh, we heard the slightly shorter, well, the substantially shorter version of the reading tonight. So it might have been exactly clear what was happening because the first part uh, is, uh, sets up the scene. So basically, there's Susanna, a very uh, pretty lady, girl of faith, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, there are two elderly men uh, who want to have as such their wicked way with her. So Suzanne, Susanna's in the garden on her own. Well, she sends her servants away, and as soon as the servants have left, these two men approach her. Hardly had the servants gone when the two elders were there after her. They said, look, the garden door is shut. No one can see us. We want to have you. So give in and let us. Refuse, and we will both give evidence that a young man was with you, and that is why you sent your maids away. Susanna sighed, I am trapped, she said. Whatever I do, if I agree, that means my death, and if I resist, I cannot get away from you. But I would prefer to fall innocent into your power than to sin in the eyes of the Lord. Then she cried out as loud as she could, and the two elders then persist with their story, that the reason she called out was because she was surprised seeing them and that uh, she had been with uh, a lover. Okay, so hence uh, she was uh, condemned to death. So she calls out to the Lord in her innocence. Now, uh, she was outnumbered, and I think there were two of them, so the evidence of two was required. There, there are two of them saying, that's what we saw. There was a, there was a man here, and there's one of her saying, I'm innocent, there was, there was nobody else there. In fact, it was the two of y'all, two of you who were looking to have your wicked way. Uh, she was outnumbered, so she didn't actually stand a chance. Uh, then the prophet Daniel is roused there to, to uh, call them out under, to, to call them out um, to, to, to reveal their lies. So which, what tree did you see them under? And they give two different names, so two different trees. So the story isn't coherent, and so then the punishment that they wanted to inflict upon Susanna falls on them and they're gone. Okay, uh, we don't need to go into the gory details, but you, wonder, you heard of the, all the earlier read with a lovely Donegal lilt. So, uh, that's that story there. So the Lord, the Lord um, in Daniel, inspiring uh, a man to look for the truth and inspiring him with great wisdom and great clarity of thought to know how, how, how to protect this girl's innocence. In our gospel then, contrastingly, uh, there's this juxtaposition of a gospel where uh, a woman is caught in adultery. She was wrong. She was caught in the act of adultery. It's said twice. So really, the, the gospel really sets it out. Here, uh, John is writing. And he sets it out so clearly, this woman was guilty. Okay, so she had committed adultery. Now, this is a serious sin. Even in, in our own day, this is, this, this is a serious thing. Like, you can destroy families, uh, you destroy a person's trust. I mean... Especially in, in when one is married, when I mean, you've made a promise to God and, and, and to the whole community that you will love this person and only this person until the death separates you. So this is a very, very serious thing. So this woman is guilty. Now, Master, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And Moses has ordered us in the law. Right? So they're, again, now, now they're underlining how serious this is and what punishment she is due. Moses said it in the law that we are to condemn women like this to death by stoning. That's what the law says. That's what Moses says. What do you say? It's a setup, right? It, the question is a setup. If you say, well, no, uh, you shouldn't stone her. Ah, so Moses and the law aren't important to you. And if you say, well, yes, it says in the law, stone her, so stone her. Okay. Her death now is, is your responsibility. It's your fault that she died. If anyone thinks that there should, be, there should have been an alternative solution, Jesus has just said that she should die by stoning. So you can't win. Either way, you're, you're, there's no kind of, there's no way, humanly speaking, there's no way out. But Jesus, of course, is pretty smart, having a divine mind also. Uh, so how does he turn it around? He starts writing on the ground. Now, Jesus didn't write any of the Gospels directly, as we all know. Jesus didn't actually put pen to paper and sit down and write the Gospels. They were written by his followers afterwards. So these are the only written words of Jesus that we know about. And they were written on dirt, sand. So he writes these 
words on the ground. Now, we don't know exactly uh, what, they, what they are, but they obviously they made some sort of an impression because there's this angry crowd ready to launch stones against this woman. Right? They're like, uh, I don't know if I could do it. I don't know. Maybe. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. I don't know. It uh, must be awful to just, like, you know. I don't know. It's awful. But um, it's an angry crowd, okay, wanting to actually kill this girl. Um, and so he, he kneels down and he starts writing on the ground with his finger. And they persisted with their questions. So you can imagine them saying, well, what do you say? Do we stone or don't we? They're persisting, they're persisting. She's guilty. She's, look, she was seen by whoever and whoever. Right? She was seen. She is guilty. What do you say? And he's like just so kind of, he's not, he's not swayed by them at all. He doesn't he sit down, down on the ground and just starts writing. You know? And then he looks up. If there is one of you who has not sinned, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Genius answer. So he's not saying the law is unimportant. He's not saying what Moses wrote, you know, it needs to be updated or whatever. Uh, nor is he saying, you know, go ahead and stone her. He's, he's actually saying, go ahead and stone her if, if you haven't committed a sin. Which, of course, all of them had. Now, uh, I think it's Anne Catherine Emmerich who describes Jesus uh, kneeled down, knelt on the ground there, writing various sins on the sand. So you can imagine then the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the crowd, they're there, ready to stone this woman, and they see their sins written on the ground by Jesus. And they're reminded that that was me. I did that as well. That's a regular recurrence. That, unfortunately, is me too. And then Jesus looks at them and says, and you can imagine that, 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 that divine gaze. He doesn't just kind of look at you and see a crowd. He's just able to look straight into your heart. And he says, if you're without sin, throw the first stone. It's, it's, a, prof it's a beautiful way of recognizing how we as Catholics, how we as Christians should should work with people. See, we're all sinners. I was going to say how we should work with sinners. We are sinners. But we're working with people who are sinners as well. So uh, how, how does this work? How can the blind lead the blind if we're all sinners? What's the point of, of doing anything? How do we do this? Does no one condemn you? No one, sir. Neither do I condemn you. Go away and don't sin anymore. So this is this... this like divinely taught balance that we must maintain. We're never ever to say that sin is okay. And at the same time, we're never to say, because you've done this, that's it, you're gone, out of my sight, you're damned. Right? Both extremes are wrong. Okay? It's, we're not judge and jury, and yet sin is wrong. So we have to try and maintain this, this balance inside where we can never say, in any circumstance, that sin is okay. Because it's not. It separates us from God. So sin is never okay. On the other hand, I'm not the judge and jury of a person's soul. It's not up to me. It's not, it's not my call. So when, I, when we see a person like Jesus sees this lady, she has broken a commandment. That's immortal sin. You know what I mean? So like this, it's, it's serious. Like the, the, the lady at the well, Jacob's well. We read about it a few weeks ago. Similarly, and the man you're with now is not your husband. So that's fornication. So the mortal sin. So these are mortal sins. And Jesus is there very calmly talking to people in a state of mortal sin. It's fantastic. It's, just, it's a great way of looking look, look how, how Jesus treats people who are way off the mark. That's also how he'll treat us, incidentally. So he says, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. So he's not saying sin is okay because he can't. Because sin would separate the person from him. So sin is never okay. But I love you. You're forgiven if you wish. Go and sin no more. You know, how to balance this justice and mercy. Because you need both. We've had this, this problem maybe for, for, I don't know, two decades or more. Where if we look exclusively at God's mercy... 
God is good, God is good, God will forgive you, it's all fine, and you keep exalting his, his mercy without justice, then it means you can simply do what you want. God doesn't really mind. It doesn't really make a difference. It doesn't really matter either way. Okay? Now, no, no, but God is merciful, but, but he's also just. Okay? Our sins, our selfishness cost him the cross. So it does make a difference what we do. And if I consistently choosing sin or choosing me or choosing the easy way or choosing vain glory or choosing my career or whatever it may be, if I'm consistently choosing that throughout my life, what's to say I'm going to choose, suddenly become so noble as to choose God at the end of my life when throughout my life I've chosen me? Do we really change so much at the last minute of our lives? It's a risky play. Very, very risky. So throughout our lives, as, as we get into the habit of, of choosing God, and we choose God, and we fall, and we choose God, and we slip, and we choose God, but overall, God willing, through his grace, we're choosing him more often than not. And we're growing and growing in sanctity. So then, yes, God is merciful, and at the same time, he, he's just. Now, again, we always must understand God's justice isn't human justice. Okay, so like there is the such thing as the person who converts at the 11th hour. You know, a person who con converts on their deathbed. You might say that's unfair. I mean, he's only gone to mass uh, never, and you know, he converts on his deathbed and gets the sacraments and is baptized. You know, ten minutes before he dies, for whatever circumstance, can he get to heaven? Absolutely. So keep in mind, this this is divine justice, not human justice. Is it like the the good thief? You know what I mean? He's like in the last seconds of his life, he converts, and that was sufficient, and. Who are you to say he can't? Who are you to say God can't be that way? God can't be that merciful. So he's merciful and just. And it's divine mercy and divine justice, not human mercy and human justice. It's, it's divine. So we, we, maintain, we maintain both of these all the time. And it's, it's a difficult balance. But something we, may, we meditated a, a couple of days ago or two weeks ago maybe. Uh, but like when we see someone in, in, in a fallen state, we know for whatever reason that their sin is, is public. It's very, very important that we remind ourselves, there go I, but for the grace of God. Thank God there were good people in my life to teach me virtue or to help me or to pray for me or to correct me when I was heading the wrong direction. Thank God. Maybe they didn't have anyone like that. So there go I, but for the grace of God. So I, I'll, I'll pray for them. And if, it's, if I'm in a position of responsibility over them, I can talk to them and say, look, sorry, mate, but as your friend, if you keep doing that, you're going to hurt people or get very hurt yourself. You're actually you're risking heaven. And I love you enough to tell you that. Now, yeah, obviously there's a whole, we won't go into it now, but before you have a conversation like that, you must prepare it in grace, you know? You must be praying for the person beforehand and never do it from a place of, I'm better than you, or I know more than you, or I've studied more than you, or I'm shock and holy, and you're just a miserable sinner. So I'm going to bequeath unto thee my vast knowledge. <laughs> You know, never. That's, 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 that's arrogance, actually. That's uh, using a person's sinful state to, to make yourself feel better. No, it doesn't work. Um, so, divine mercy, divine justice. And both are, are real and both are necessary. If it's all just justice, 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 none of us stand a chance. <laughs> if it's all mercy, if it's all mercy and no justice, then it doesn't matter what you do. But it also doesn't matter what everyone else has done that has hurt you. It doesn't matter. You can commit any sin you want and ultimately it doesn't really matter. That's, that makes God actually not good because then bad actions have no consequences. It just doesn't matter. And that's not fair. That's not right. That's not true. It's not what Jesus teaches. It's not what the church teaches. It's not what the gospel teaches. It's not divine justice. So we do have to maintain these, the two of them. And it's... it's uh, it's very important in order to balance, to balance our faith and balance our understanding of God. Okay, I had a wee story, but uh, we've, I've gone on a bit too long, so I won't. Uh, so, as we look at our, our, our reading in our gospel, we see a lady who's accused innocently, who calls out to God, and God grants her justice. We see a lady who's guilty of adultery, and the Lord, with such tenderness, with such compassion and love, saves her life. 
and I would imagine brought about in her a great conversion. Some argue this is Mary Magdalene. Could be. So Lord, you never give up on us. And whether we're innocent or guilty, your gaze rests upon us. Your merciful eyes are always looking upon us as your sons and your, your daughters, knowing that we can do better, knowing that we can be holier, and giving us the grace to do so. You never give up on us because you love us. Help us, Lord, to understand your heart, to understand your mercy, your justice, to understand that our sin, if we don't let it, isn't enough to keep us from you. Amen.